Hi, welcome everyone to the Center for Subsurface Energy and Environment webinar series. My name is Matt Bauhoff and I'm the director of the center and also a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering. To learn more about us uh, and the center, please visit our website. Also follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter and uh, join our YouTube group. Just a little bit more about us. Um, we are a group of principal investigators, graduate students and research staff. Uh, you can see some of the faculty that are involved. Um, it's over 25 different faculty are involved in the center. We do a wide variety of research um, in terms of subsurface applications, technical disciplines, and use uh, many different engineering tools. Uh, we collaborate with industry in many different ways. One of those is with our industrial affiliate programs. Um, and you can see that we've got about a dozen of them. I've highlighted the chemical enhanced oil recovery industrial affiliate program because our speaker today is Gary Pope, who founded that IAP and continues to be very involved. Uh, our webinars um, are informative industry driven webinars by researchers and collaborators in the center. Uh, they're hosted the second Tuesday of each month at noon via Teams. Uh, we hope that you're able to attend live so that you can participate and ask questions, but all webinars are uploaded on our YouTube channel within a few days. I encourage you to go uh, visit and, and watch some of our older webinars. We do have one coming up in December by Dr. Alberto Lopez on characterization of unconventional reservoirs using logging while drilling information to improve hydraulic fracture spacing. Uh, and um, finally, I'll point out that um, please post your questions in the Q&A section and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the end. So today will be more conversational. I'll have a number of questions for Gary, but if you have other questions, um, please add those. So uh, our speaker today is Dr. Gary Pope. So he is a professor and emeritus in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at UT Austin, where he's taught here from 1977 through 2019. He owes a bachelor's degree from Oklahoma State and a PhD from Rice University, both in chemical engineering. He started his career in Shell in 1971 and has co-authored 400 technical papers and he's inventor of 30 patents. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 1999 and has won numerous awards through the Society of Petroleum Engineers and elsewhere. Um, on one final note, um, most of uh, what I know and have learned about chemical enhanced oil recovery and polymer flooding has come uh, through Gary and working him uh, with him for over 15 years. So uh, I'm excited about uh, today's webinar and to, to have a conversation with him. Thank you, Matt. Um, so just a little bit more background. I, I did work on mainly on polymers and surfactants for chemical EOR, chemical flooding, we called it, um, during my shell days, 71 to 76, but, and then continued that with my students and postdocs and colleagues uh, at the University of Texas uh, after 1977. My work uh, involved doing experiments, uh, but also some modeling. Um, what eventually became the UT Chem Compositional Chemical Flooding Simulator uh, started and during those days, uh, <clears throat> wrote a, a 1D code. Um, and it was the first time that someone had tried to capture all of the complicated chemistry and physics in a compositional code at that, at that time. Um, I uh, also got involved in a lot of field projects over the years after I uh, started at UT. Uh, as a consultant and continue to be involved in, in field projects um, of various kinds, especially polymer flooding. OK, great. Well, um, I, I think that's a pretty good introduction about your history and how you became involved in chemical enhanced oil recovery. Uh, I think we have a, a, an audience with a, a wide variety of bit different backgrounds. So Gary, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what chemical enhanced oil recovery is. What are the most common methods 
and uh, what are their main mechanisms for recovery? Okay, so the main processes are polymer flooding, which is by far the largest uh, commercially, um, but also surfactants and polymers or SP flooding. Uh, when we add alkali, we call it ASP flooding, alkali surfactant polymer flooding, uh, sometimes just alkali and polymer together. Uh, and more recently, alkali co-solvent polymer flooding. And you can also add um, heat to water. We're going to maybe touch on hot polymer flooding today. So there's various different combinations of those uh, processes, uh, but <clears throat> by far the biggest one's polymer. Now, so polymer flooding uh, improves or increases both the displacement sweep efficiency and the volumetric sweep efficiency. So displacement sweep efficiency is sometimes called microscopic sweep efficiency. In other words, it's displacing the oil more efficiently in the pores. It does that because it increases the water viscosity, which shifts the fractional flow curve in a favorable direction and sweeps the oil, especially heavy oil, out of the pores more efficiently. <clears throat> That's harder to visualize and less well understood than the volumetric one, which has to do, you know, aerial and vertical sweep and uh, reducing fingering and, and mitigating heterogeneities and so forth. Uh, but they're both important. The displacement sweep efficiency is more important for heavy oil. Uh, the volumetric sweep efficiency is more important uh, to mitigate heterogeneities. Okay. Well. Well. Great. So. Um... If I uh, if I was looking at using chemical enhanced oil recovery, um, how would I know if it's appropriate for a particular oil reservoir? And uh, of all these different uh, different types, how do I decide which method to use? That's a hard question, especially to answer uh, briefly. <clears throat> and so I I'll just hit a couple of highlights. First, the, probably the best advice I can give, ironically. Uh, is don't put too much weight on old papers and books because they're usually out of date. And, <laughs> excuse me, um, the technology has evolved rapidly and it's much better than it used to be and, and it can be applied under much wider conditions than it used to be. Yeah. And so, so don't put too much weight on those. Uh, one quick note, if the viscosity of the oil is more than 100 centipoise, polymer flooding is likely to be at least the starting point. Uh, polymers can, floods can be followed by surfactant floods, so it doesn't preclude that uh, happening uh, afterwards. Uh, so those are just a few things. Of course, uh, good reservoirs, good permeability, good porosity, all those things are always uh, uh, good. And, and if you've had a successful water flood, that's a good sign that you're likely to be successful on the chemical flood because that means the geology is probably favorable. Okay, yeah, great. So, um, you know, polymer flooding continues to be the most widely used chemical EOR method. Um, why is that and, and has that changed over the years? Do you expect it to change? Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> it's polymer flooding is the most widely used uh, because it's simple. Uh, it's the least expensive, uh, it's the most robust method, <clears throat> has the most proven commercial success worldwide, including some very large polymer floods. Dodging comes to mind. Uh, there are huge reservoirs of heavy oil in conventional reservoirs, uh, trillions of barrels, and uh, many of those are too heavy to water flood. Uh, also, polymers have a very wide range of properties now. They are commercially available, uh, large quantities at low cost, different molecular weights and different characteristics. The polymers have improved a lot. Our experience has improved. Uh, we have better lab methods, better testing methods. Uh, we can use polymers at higher temperature and higher salinity. In fact, I recommend you, <clears throat> you know, don't even screen out reservoirs on those uh, uh, criteria. Um, laboratory uh, quality control methods have improved and all of those advances taken together really have been a game changer over the last 50 years. And so it's a very attractive process now, especially for heavy oil. Okay. And um, if I am going to do a polymer flood, 
um, how do I decide which polymer to use for a particular field? Yes, so the least expensive polymer is uh, hydro, steel hydrolyzed polyacrylamides. It's been used the most. Um, it's available over a range of molecular weights, of high quality and low cost. Uh, however, if, uh, if, if you have a combination of high temperature uh, and high hardness in the brine, then uh, newer polymers that are slightly more expensive uh, need to be considered. And those, the biggest difference is very briefly, without going into chemical details, is uh, the sulfonation. In other words, the, the more their uh, sulfonate is on the molecule, uh, the better the stability and, and under those conditions of uh, high hardness and, and high temperature. It's the combination that requires those kind of polymers. Uh, regardless, of course, <coughs> uh, the appropriate lab test needs to be made to select the best polymer for a particular reservoir. Okay. And uh, well, I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question to that. So, so Gary, you and I have done some recent work with polyethylene oxide. Uh, do you see that as being promising, and and where uh, where do you see it most uh, possible to be used? Yeah, it's uh, still I would say in the research stage, but it's very interesting and exciting for some special uh, conditions, um, uh, particularly low permeability oil wet carbonates. It appears to have some uh, interesting and and unique. Uh, uniquely favorable properties under those conditions. We've even seen some reduction in the residual oil saturation uh, with with that high molecular weight polyethylene oxide. So I think we need to do some more work there and I think it would be justified to do some field tests. Okay, great. Uh, what is the current cost of polymer per barrel of incremental oil recovery? Uh, how has that changed over your career and, and you know, how do we decide w whether or not it's going to be economical? So um, it takes about three to five pounds of polymer to recover a barrel of oil, an incremental barrel of oil by polymer flooding. Uh, the price <clears throat> ranges between about one to two dollars a pound, depending upon the polymer. And uh, so that that. Very loosely, that translates into about five dollars per barrel for just the polymer. Uh, but then, of course, you have other cost, and if it's an existing water flood, uh, the costs aren't very great incrementally. But nevertheless, you may end up under appropriate conditions, good conditions, with a total cost of twenty to thirty dollars per barrel. So that actually makes it uh, a very attractive. I also want to mention too that the life of the polymer flood is shorter than the water flood. You produce less water and <clears throat> that's attractive, especially nowadays because it reduces the carbon uh, footprint. So uh, briefly, the technology has improved tremendously over my career. The price has gotten lower and lower. When I first started out, polyacrylamide was $1.50 a pound. Now it's a little less than $1.50 a pound if you put in inflation or if you consider relative to the price of oil, uh, it's like 10 times cheaper. So that's that's a really big deal. That's a game changer. Uh, so relative, again, relative to the price of oil, it's, it's gotten cheaper and cheaper over the years. Great. So, um, well, in, in all your time that you've been working with this, which is about 50 years of experience, what do you see as the most significant advances in engineering design of polymer floods? Okay, so one of the things I want to mention is that now we, again we're talking about engineering design, not the chemistry for the moment. Uh, when we first started out doing polymer flooding, or the oil companies did, they didn't use enough polymer. They put in a fraction of a pore volume, maybe thirty percent of a pore volume, something like that. They used low polymer concentrations, maybe 500 ppm. So as time went on, we learned that higher concentrations were more effective, more profitable, and injecting larger pore volumes, maybe a whole pore volume was more profitable. Now, what you really need to do is just keep injecting polymer as long as you're making a profit. 
and that could be even more than a poor volume. <clears throat> and it's usually more than predicted. So the simulators tended to underpredict it for a variety of reasons. Uh, part, it's hard to capture the fingering. Uh, they didn't use a fine enough grid, all kinds of reasons. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not saying it can't be done. I believe in sim the simulators are useful. We, you know, have worked hard to make UTChem as as complete and, and, and practical as, as possible, then it's a useful tool. But nevertheless, the, the main message I want to get across is just count on injecting polymer for a long time and as long as you're producing oil, making money, and not just put in a fraction of a poor volume. And also higher polymer concentration almost always uh, works out. And one another reason why that's true is because people sometimes measure permeability reduction factors in the laboratory, and then they assume that that adds to the uh, decrease in the mobility ratio. Uh, I wouldn't count on that <clears throat> at all. I would assume it's not uh, helpful. I would assume it's the re permeability reduction factor and residual resistance factor is one. And that means then you need more viscosity and that gets back to that point about putting in a uh, higher polymer concentration. Remember the polymer is really inexpensive and it's really doing a lot of good. <clears throat> so, you know, put in enough. OK, well, so um, what about low permeability carbonates? Um, can polymer flooding be used there? And why does the capillary number matter for, for some of those carbonate reservoirs? I think it's a huge target. <clears throat> World's full of uh, those kind of uh, reservoirs. And the recovery is often low. And polymer flooding uh, has been done in, in some uh, carbonates successfully and commercially. Uh, of course, you need to tailor the polymer to the rock. You need to do the appropriate lab test, et cetera, et cetera. But I think there's huge potential there. Now, with respect to the capillary number, carbonates uh, often have a wider pore size distribution, and that mean, that changes the capillary desaturation curve. It means you don't have to put as much pressure gradient on the rock to start reducing the residual oil saturation because it's much broader and wider. That's a big deal. So I highly, highly recommend measuring the capillary desaturation curve for the, the specific reservoir uh, core on the core, the carbonate core. Uh, many of them, uh, a few years ago, Chevron uh, published some uh, using reservoir rocks that showed very favorable CDCs. In other words, you can reduce the residual oil saturation in some of those rocks with polymer flooding, but you have to measure it to find out because they're all different. Okay, and um, what what about um, you know naturally fractured carbonates? There's a huge potential there. Uh, I think polymers can be used under some cases. They're very complex, and as everybody knows, the uh, fracture spacing and aperture and so forth make tremendous difference, and so you, they have to be tested. There have been a limited number of polymer floods in fractured uh, carbonates that were successful. Uh, that's not very well known. Uh, so I, my biggest uh, uh, piece of advice is, you know, just, you know, don't, don't assume it can't be done. OK, now, uh, you know, the, the proper tests need to be made and, and it's a lot more complex, but but uh, don't rule it out automatically. Okay. Uh, now, of course, you know, low salinity uh, water flooding is, is extremely popular. Uh, does it make sense to combine that with polymers? If low sal itself makes sense, then adding polymer will almost always make sense. Because you're. The fact that you have low salinity water or softened water uh, or softer water at least <clears throat> means you get more bang for the buck from the polymer. OK, that's the starting point. But <clears throat> if if the low sal, to the extent low sal works, it you know, reduces the residual oil saturation a few percent, then you're trying to form an oil bank. To propagate an oil bank and capture it in oil wells, you need mobility control. 
So it makes perfect sense from fundamental principles and practice to combine the two things. So I would almost always <clears throat> add polymer to low sal. Low sal itself makes sense for a particular application. Okay. Uh, well, so let me ask you something about something that's you know very dear to my heart and something that I I've do, done a lot of research with. Um, numerous labs, including our own, um, and you and I working together, have shown that polymers that are viscoelastic can reduce residual oil saturation. Do you see that as an important practical mechanism and potential use? Yes, viscoelasticity, though, is complex. Uh, it's been studied. We've studied it. Many other people have studied it. Uh, there have been reports of uh, favorable results uh, from using uh, highly viscoelastic polymers. Uh, <clears throat> So you have to have high Debra number, and so you have to have special conditions, high molecular weight polymer, high velocities, uh, high permeability is favored, um, soft water is favored, or at least low hardness. Uh, you have to have some, those conditions. And, but, and then the other thing is, when implemented in the field, <coughs> uh, you have to be sure you don't shear degrade those high molecular weight molecules that's in the, because those are the ones that are most elastic. And and I think more effort needs to be put into that in terms of both the lab and the field to do it in a way that makes sense or to find out when it makes sense. So it's very interesting, like so many of these other things that we've talked about and are can, going to can talk about, but uh, it has to be done under very special conditions and very uh, controlled conditions. Okay. Uh, so, um... Under what conditions does it make sense to heat the water used for polymer flooding? So, there's <clears throat> another, <coughs> excuse me, another uh, new, I mean, it's been studied before, but until recently it hadn't been done, uh, which again, it, it, it has to be, it's a little more complicated. It has to be studied in uh, particular circumstances. Uh, the idea is that you could push the application of polymer flooding to even heavier oils. Because when you heat it, the oil viscosity goes down much faster than the water viscosity does. Uh, but you're going to have to have certain conditions, mainly high porosity, because <clears throat> otherwise you too much of the heat will be lost. So uh, thick reservoirs are better as, as well. Now, we're not talking about steam flooding. We're talking about just a modest increase in temperature, maybe 30, 40, 50 degrees. So we're not putting much energy in, the heat losses are much less, the, the cost is much less, but yet we get maybe a reduction of oil viscosity, maybe from 10,000 to 1,000 or from 1,000 to 100 or something like that, with just a modest cost. Uh, so um, it's being tried um, and it's worth more uh, attention, both in the lab and in the field and, and with the simulators. Our simulators like UTGM are capable of uh, making those predictions. Okay, and so you, you mentioned that it's been tried. Are there field examples of hot polymer flooding? There's one going on right now in Texas, <clears throat> um, not published yet, uh, probably will be next year. And, oh, great. Um, so <clears throat> we're, it's, it's being done. Okay. Um, well, what are the most important quality control methods needed for polymer flooding? And why are they so important for the success of the flood? And then, you know, what, uh, what are the most common mistakes or problems and how can they be avoided? That's a very good question because uh, it's so vitally important, so critically important. Uh, polymer flooding is great technology, but you have to do it right. And that means quality control. So let's start with the quality of the water. Uh, you need clean water. It doesn't have to be low salinity. I mean, it, it, the new polymers will tolerate very high salinity. That's not the problem. It's But if it has a lot of undissolved solids in it, maybe iron, uh, oil, uh, all of the above, uh, then it, it could be a problem. And the water may have to be treated or replaced with some better water or filtered or uh, a chemical added to... Uh, Treat the uh, iron or whatever, um, and that 
again, requires some specialized knowledge and specialized uh, lab tests and so forth. But uh, it, it, in a nutshell, you got to have good water. Again, again, just to repeat, it doesn't mean it has to be fresh water, anything that's 50 years out of date. It could be very high salinity water. It just it just needs to be uh, clean. OK. Uh, so one more thing about polymer flooding. So. Um, you know, the energy transition and reducing the carbon footprint is, is very important. Uh, how can polymer floods be used to reduce the carbon footprint of oil production? Well, I already mentioned one way. <clears throat> you produce a lot less water than you do in a comparable water flood because it's so much more efficient. You may get out the oil in a couple of pore volumes that it would take 20, 30, 50, 100 pore volumes uh, of water flooding. Uh, assuming you could do it that long. And uh, so that's <clears throat> that's one uh, very important way. Um, it It's being considered in some cases with uh, some moderately viscous oils as an alternative to steam flooding and would have a much, much lower carbon footprint than steam flooding. And we now know, we didn't know that 50 years ago or even 30 years ago, we now know from actual large scale floods um, that the polymers flooding can be successful and profitable uh, even with very viscous oils and, and even without heating. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, there's some wonderful examples uh, going on right now in Canada and Alaska and other places in the world. So, so that, um, that are, those are just some of the ways where uh, you can reduce carbon footprint. And, and Gary, can polymer flooding be used in uh, together with CO2 flooding? Uh, that is a, worth studying. <laughs> it's not a mature technology, but I, I, I get why you're asking, because um, you, you could uh, improve the CO2 flood by adding, by thickening the water. And I'm a little surprised that hasn't been done more. Uh, because it's such a good idea, but it's not mature technology. It, it needs to be studied some more and tried some, and optimized. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, I, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and ask some questions about uh, other chemical EOR methods. Um, but I would like to use this time to uh, tell our audience again that they're welcome to add um, ask some questions. Um, in the Q&A, and uh, we will try to get to a few of those at, at the end. Uh, but uh, it, Gary, when does it make sense to add alkali, co-solvent, or other chemicals to the polymer solution? Well, if, the, uh, if it's a heavy oil, it usually has a high acid number, and then when you add the alkali, you get soap and reduces the interfacial tension at very low cost. Uh, so that leads you to Processes, one of the oldest is alkali polymer. Um, however, uh, alkali polymer often hasn't worked as well as predicted. So we worked on a process uh, a few years ago where we added some co-solvent and that uh, makes the process work a lot better. So I'm not saying it's always needed, but, but it should be uh, considered. Uh, <clears throat> now, a lot of times uh, you have to soften the water. Usually you have to soften the water to use the alkali, right? And that adds to the cost, although it can be done very cheaply now. Uh, and it can be done and has been done on, uh, for other applications on a very large scale. So, yeah, you, you save a lot of money. Now, if you're if you add it with surfactant, of course, then we're back to ASP flooding. And there's some tremendous uh, successes with ASP flooding, but always on a small scale so far. Um, but those are lower cost, much lower cost in some cases, because less surfactant is needed than for just surfactant polymer flooding. <laughs> so, you know, there are examples. Um, Marmel is a recent example in Oman. Um, Mongola in India. Um, you know, there are others uh, that, that have been done 
uh, Minas in, in Indonesia. I'm not going to name all of them. Uh, so, frankly, I don't think people fully sometimes appreciate that it's worth softening the water. So you can add alkali because the benefit is so great. It is also more complicated, though. We have to be honest about that. So it requires more study, more tests, more uh, understanding, uh, more complicated models and so forth than SP. So as you go from polymer to SP to SP, of course, it gets a lot more complicated. But I think it's worth the effort, uh, especially when you have a oil with high uh, acid number. OK. Well, it seems that um, the oil production from alkali polymer floods has been less than expected. Uh, why would you say that is? OK. <clears throat> So um, the biggest single reason is because the laboratory tests aren't done right. And the biggest single reason they're not done right, in most cases historically, is because they don't uh, allow enough residence time. The tests are done in short cores and too fast, too high of velocity. So <clears throat> there are some reactions going on, chemical reactions. Those take time. Uh, you cannot just assume you get you can scale it up. In fact, you can't scale it up uh, from tests that are done in only a few hours in short course. So it can be done. And in fact, that's been known for a very, very long time, but not widely practiced. So so the residence time issue is, uh, you know, for, for surfactant polymer flooding, the rule of thumb, and it is just a rule of thumb, is the test needs to be take at least one day. Um, if you're going at one foot per day and a one foot core, that takes a residence time of one or two days. Uh, for alkali polymer, you need even more time than that. Why is that? Well, because sometimes you get uh, viscous macroemulsions and <clears throat> they change over time and they're hard to predict, they're hard to control, uh, they're hard to model, <clears throat> they don't scale up. <clears throat> so. So you, you, you just, uh, and, and you don't capture that correctly uh, in a uh, lab test uh, if it's done too, uh, too quickly. Uh, there are some other things like in, like the length of the core. <clears throat> uh, for screening purposes, we like a foot, but uh, honestly, for something like AP, you better go up to even longer cores. Uh, that takes more time and, and more expense, but <clears throat> you, can get the data you need to feed into a simulator to actually scale it up, to actually make it work or decide it won't work uh, in the field. And so it there have been an amazing number of failures of that process uh, because of the lab tests were done uh, the wrong way. So I'm not saying it can't be done. It can be. We know how. We know how. It's just not widely practiced. OK, now you say, well, what about the other? Well, OK, I mentioned co-solvents. You add co-solvent, it speeds things up. So you still need to be careful, but it doesn't take as long for local equilibrium. The key is local equilibrium. Local equilibrium is a very, very important concept. And I hate to get, I don't want to get academic here, but <clears throat> people really need to understand it, what it means. We don't have equilibrium in the core and the reservoir. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about local equilibrium. OK, in the pores <clears throat> at a given time, have the fluids had enough time to separate and, and to react and to come to a local equilibrium? That's a really important question that doesn't get uh, studied enough <clears throat> and controlled enough. So uh, OK, so I'm not against AP. Uh, this is, has to be done right um, uh, to scale it up, to predict it, get the results you want in the field. You can. Uh, the, the same thing is true with SP and, and, and ASP, but you know most of the time with those processes, we do add co-solvent. It has all kinds of advantages. It reduces absorption, speeds up equilibrium, reduces viscosity, uh, 
breaks macro emulsions, the list goes on and on and on. So they more than pay for themselves. And so that's why <clears throat> in most cases, if you're going to use one of those processes, you, I, I recommend you uh, add co-solvent. By co-solvent, I'm talking about the old ones are alcohols, of course, but now we have the uh, ethoxylated uh, alcohols and ethoxylated phenol and so forth, and they're inexpensive and they've been used in the field and they're commercially available. And you know, if just if you want to make it, if you want to reduce the risk, you want to get the best results, you want to re reduce the cost, you want to make it robust, you want to be able to predict it with your models and so forth. It, you you almost always want to use some co-solvent. Well, why does it sometimes make sense to polymer flood first and then follow with an SP or ASP flood? And are there any examples of large commercial floods using the strategy? Uh, in India, in, uh, in uh, uh, Mongola, the Mongola field, the big Mongola field in uh, northern India is an example where <clears throat> They've done commercial polymer flooding, very successful. They followed it in a, uh, with a pilot, with ASP, and after a very mature polymer flood, they polymer flooded it for a long time, that particular uh, pilot, uh, and they got great results. In fact, one of the best results ever observed. Why is that? Well, partly because the polymer helps condition the reservoir. It helps mitigate some of the heterogeneities. And so it's a little bit counterintuitive, but at least under that particular circumstance and similar circumstances, it's worth uh, considering. It's an old idea, but uh, rarely practiced. Uh, but this is a, you know, look at look at Mongol. It's a published uh, result. Um, All right. Well, what are the most favorable conditions for surfactant polymer and alkali surfactant polymer methods? Well, as with any uh, process like a flooding process, um, high porosity and high permeability doesn't mean you have to have those things, but it shortens the life of the project, of course, when you do have high porosity and permeability. It does more than that. Uh, you get less retention of the chemicals at high porosity. Uh, so those are favorable uh, Conditions, of course, high remaining oil saturation. You have to have a target. Uh, it's a good idea to start <clears throat> polymer flooding early. By the way, uh, and uh, the remaining oil saturation. I'm using that instead of residual because, in most cases, uh, your you know, your water flood hasn't gone all the way down to residual everywhere in the reservoir. So when you introduce polymer and polymer wisofactin or ASP, you get cross flow, viscous cross flow and so forth. You pump oil out of the tighter zones and so forth. So, um, uh, you know, those are some of the favorable conditions and not all of them. One of the things that people observed over decades is that if the water flood went well, if you had a successful water flood, that's an indication of favorable geology. So more likely to be a favorable target for enhanced oil recovery, chemical EOR in particular. So that's another uh, indication. Of course, what else, do, how else can you tell? <clears throat> Put in interwell tracers. In fact, do that every time without exception. Pulse the reservoir with interwell tracers. See what those tracers do. Interpret them quantitatively. We have really good methods for doing that now. Uh, it's simple and it's inexpensive and if find out you know whether the tracers break through too early or not uh, you can calculate sweat pore volumes uh, it, you know it's a really good technology very mature technology uh, in the in the beginning it was just used qualitatively now we do it quantitatively right can also be used to help condition the simulators and so forth but you don't have to do that. Can you interpret the data with a spreadsheet? They're analytical solutions. Um, so <clears throat> if you really want to know, put in interwell tracers. And then even, and if it turns out to be a good candidate, the, the, you also use that data to help you decide how much mobility control you need, maybe help you decide well spacing, uh, and so forth and so on. Um, 
and that's another thing. <clears throat> Uh, in most cases, it's worth considering uh, infield drilling, reducing the well spacing. Uh, you're going to very likely make more money if you do the flood over a reasonable length of time with a relatively small well spacing. That spacing will depend on the process, of course. Uh, for polymer flooding, it doesn't need to be quite as low, especially if you use horizontal wells, which is another great innovation, by the way, should have mentioned. Uh, but if you're using vertical wells and you're using surfactant, then you're probably going to want to go down to relatively small uh, well spacing. And even though those wells cost you money, you're going to make more money on the flood because it doesn't make any sense to do floods that take 20, 30 years. You're just wasting your time. So you need to design it <clears throat> to where it only takes maybe five years. So, uh, it, Gary, uh, surfactant retention is obviously an important consideration in these methods. Um, how do we achieve very low surfactant retention? Well, the classical method is the salinity gradient. <clears throat> you uh, step the salinity down. That doesn't mean low salinity. It just means lower salinity. So you might start at 100,000 parts per million and step it down to 80,000 parts per million, just as an example. Uh, <clears throat> But that makes a tremendous difference in terms of reducing surfactant retention. And those mechanisms are well known and they're proven and in the field. Uh, second method, of course, is co-solvents. Very effective, very cost effective. Uh, if you use, if you raise the pH with alkali, of course, that also reduces it. If you use a combination of those methods, you can get down to very low adsorption, approaching zero. Okay. Well, um, I, I just have a few more questions and then maybe we can get to some of the questions from the audience. But uh, what are the most significant uncertainties in chemical ENR in chemical EOR and what can we do about them? Well, the biggest uncertainty is usually geology. <clears throat> that gets us back to tracers because um, you can minimize that uncertainty uh, by uh, using interwell tracers. Uh, there's usually some uncertainty in terms of the oil saturation. You can <clears throat> use single well tracer tests to determine that. Uh, you can use the tracers to help you decide the well spacing and the well pattern and, and where the sweet spots are and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> so um, geology, 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 right? And all these things have to be fully integrated. In other words, it's a team effort. Uh, Again, uh, the models have to be used with a fine grid. They have to be used with the right mechanisms. Uh, they have to be used carefully uh, with experience, carefully calibrated and so forth. But all of those things can, uh, the model can be helpful, including understanding the, the uh, geology. But the heterogeneity is typically more than what we think it is. In my experience, and I've had a lot of experience all over the world, dozens of times, dozens of companies, different kinds of reservoirs and geology and so forth. <clears throat> and we're, it's usually more, the tracers usually show us more heterogeneity than the logs and the cores and, and history matching and, and seismic and everything else put together. So <clears throat> that means, of course, mobility control is even more important. And, and we have to make sure we mitigate those heterogeneities with mobility control. And, and that means polymer, of course, in, in this context. Uh, and, but it, uh, you know, when you simulate it, you've got to populate it with those heterogeneities. You've got, you have to do it with a really fine grid. Uh, if you're trying to simulate water pushing out polymer, for example, it takes this incredibly fine grid to capture that. Um, and, and Part of that's heterogeneity, part of it's uh, fingering. So you have to, to, to do it uh, with a super fine grid. I'm talking about maybe as little as a couple feet in the X, Y, and Z directions. You say, well, that's, that's, that's too expensive. It'll run too slow or something, <clears throat> especially if you're using a mechanistic simulator like UT Chem. Okay, it's better to do a simulation if it takes a day or two days, three days, that gives you useful results than to run one that runs in a couple of hours. 
In fact, I'm against doing simulations that run too fast. It's a bad idea. <clears throat> I'm really, I'm serious. It's not a joke. <laughs> because you can't, and you can't do it right. You can't interpret the results. You can't understand the results. You can't communicate the results in, in such a short period of time. What we what we should be doing is making predictions, not history matching the past. Uh, <clears throat> but if you insist on doing history matching, then you still have to do it with a fine grid, <clears throat> and you don't want to believe the results uh, because. If you're tuning, you know, if you're turning all the knobs, okay, what you want to do is do good measurements and feed the simulator good data, <coughs> condition it uh, with that tracer data, uh, <coughs> and use a super fine grid and let it run as long as you need to. Put in the chemistry, put in the, all the mechanisms that are needed for that particular process. If it's polymer, you still the polymer rheology is really important. We we have very very good polymer rheology models now. Use them, right? Don't use the old stuff 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, polymers are not, you know, just shear thinning. For example, the rheology is a little more complicated than that. So <clears throat> take your time. Do it right. Let the simulator run if it needs to for a whole day or whatever. Right? Use a good simulator. Use a fine grid. I'm repeating myself on purpose. <clears throat> OK, and don't try to run lots of simulations fast. What you want to do is put all your effort into making predictions. And you say, well, what, 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 what if my simulation doesn't exactly match the water flood or something? OK. What's the problem here? Just, <laughs> I, I'm getting carried away. <clears throat> I, I, if we had more time, I would explain in more depth. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, so um, if maybe you've already answered that there, but what what one piece of advice do you have for companies considering a polymer flood or chemical UR project? Well, you need to start with uh, good lab data. You need to work with a good polymer vendor, and and that certainly exists. The um, <clears throat> the polymer facilities are much better now. The polymer equipment, the they're simpler to use as well. Uh, uh, you know, you got to have it's a team effort again, uh, <clears throat> and uh, if you're going to use that simulator, of course, uh, use it very uh, carefully and use it in the right way. Uh, so those are those are just some of the things that, that need to be done. And then just go do it. You know, in most cases, polymer plating is so mature. You don't need to do injectivity tests. You don't need to do pallets. And, and, and truthfully, you know, people have done a isolated five spots for more than 50 years. And those are hard to interpret. And you can't necessarily assume that they're representative, they're usually not. And so if the reservoir has the proper characteristics and if you pick the right polymer and you design it the right way and you flood it the right way and you have good quality control, that's critical, of course, critical, then <clears throat> uh, at current prices, you're gonna have to mess up really bad not to make money <laughs> with polymer flooding. And so <clears throat> why do you wanna waste time? doing a pilot with such a mature technology. Would you do a pilot in a, if you have a reservoir that has favorable characteristics for water flood, do you go out and do a single five spot water flood pilot and for several years before you start to water flood? No. Well, then we're, okay. So we're at that same point now with, with uh, polymer flooding. Now, <clears throat> Matt, I don't want to, preempt one of your questions, but I want to sneak this in in case we run out of time. <clears throat> There's another huge application out there for surfactants, which is the unconventional, it's the tight oil, right? It's new, but it's being done. It's big. It may be end up being the single biggest application of surfactants in the future. It's huff and puff. You stimulate the wells. You get a quick return. Why do it? Well, because the recoveries are low, 
And because you can make a lot more oil and a lot more money by stimulating with surfactant, if you pick the right surfactant, of course, do the right test <clears throat> the right way. OK, so that's a whole different ball game. And I wanted to be sure we touched on it. We can talk some more about it if you want to, if we have time. But, well, yeah, we, we are kind of running out of time and I want to get to the audience questions, but I had one last question for you, which is how do we um, how do we convince you to take all this uh, experience and knowledge and, and to put it in a book for the rest of us? <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that question. I know you weren't. <laughs> 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 uh, well, believe it or not, I'm a pretty busy guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Still working, helping people and working on the field projects and so forth and having having fun doing it and still writing papers. Uh, but you're right <clears throat> in principle. It should be captured. Maybe maybe we could team up. <clears throat> but uh, I, I, I think that is is needed. There's for sure yeah. it's needed. Right. Sure. So, touche. <laughs> okay. um, well, well, since we have uh, just under 10 minutes left, uh, maybe we can go to some of the questions in the Q&A. We have a few, and I, I encourage our audience to continue asking questions if, um, if they have some. So, uh, so John has a question that uh, polymer flooding in heavy oil north slope Alaska fields is proving to be effective. Is there something about the long horizontal well water flood geometry that uh, makes it amenable to polymer flooding even with highly viscous oil? Well, first of all, you're certainly right. <clears throat> uh, the polymer floods in Alaska are really going well, and <clears throat> I predict there may end up being the world's largest uh, billions, potentially billions of barrels of, of oil recovery. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's not the horizontal wells are, are a really good idea uh, because you're getting good aerial sweep. <clears throat> it could be done with the vertical wells, but but obviously it's working with horizontal wells. Uh, they, I, I will make a comment though that the the injectivity per foot of well is actually lower for the horizontal well. They, that, that, that we've known that for a long time. The experience in Canada, for example, with polymer flooding using horizontal wells. Uh, but I think on balance, on balance, uh, yeah. they usually make sense. Um, <clears throat> but the, the, uh, the with the, with your vertical wells, <clears throat> you often uh, have a, a significant benefit from your shear thinning. And also, most of them have been injected both water and polymer above parting pressure. And that uh, greatly improves the injectivity. Okay. Okay. Uh, so uh, another question is uh, from Maradi: Is it, it appears that most of polymer injection wells suffer from losing injectivity over time, uh, so they have to build up pressure. What would you recommend to mitigate the issue of pressure building up? Well, if the pressure is building up because you're forming an oil bank, uh, and the oil bank will always have lower mobility than the uh, you know water at residual oil, uh, then uh, it's just part of the price you're paying for getting more oil and more and getting it more efficiently. <clears throat> you could reduce spacing, of course, whether you're using vertical or horizontal wells. That's one uh, option. Um, a lot of operators uh, don't realize that uh, if they can inject above parting pressure, and, and many of them are injecting above parting pressure, uh, and in some cases that uh, it, it speeds things up uh, tremendously without hurting anything, as long as you don't frack out a zone or something like that, you need to know what you're doing. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I guess um, that, you know again you're 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 improving the efficiency of the flood. So what else can you do uh, besides reduce spacing? Yeah, well, it, well, and you mentioned um, water quality before. I would imagine that um, poor water quality could lead to poor injection, right? 
Yeah, thank you for repeating that, reminding me, because <clears throat> I said if the cause was the mobility of the oil bank, but now if yeah. it's something else, if it's because poor quality polymer or water or some combination thereof, uh, then of course that problem needs to be solved. And that has happened a lot of times, a lot of places, and there's really no excuse for it. <clears throat> it just needs to be done right. So work with people that have the right experience and, 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 and set up a field lab and test things daily and make the appropriate ob observations, uh, viscosity, for example, uh, clean water, uh, filtration ratio. Uh, it, you know, th those are well known, they're simple, they're inexpensive, uh, they can be done in the field. So those are some, and, and, and you know, and as good as the polymers are now, uh, it, it, you know, occasionally you might get a bad batch or something, or it might be stored the wrong way or mixed the wrong way or something. The maybe the hydration unit is malfunctions or something. So those those tests need to be done so you don't plug up your well or or even just reduce its injectivity. If you do, there are ways of fixing it, uh, but of course, a lot better just to prevent it. Yep. Uh, so carbonate reservoirs tend to be oil wet. What uh, effect does that have on the performance of a polymer flood? Well, <clears throat> um, sometimes we see lower polymer retention in the oil wet rocks. In some cases, significantly lower, right? Um, <clears throat> You get different shape relative permeability curves, speaking in general. Um, it can actually be, again, in the favorable direction. Uh, in many cases, we get lower residual oil saturation with polymers. Even the, the, the polyacrylamides and the sulfonated polyacrylamides, and now maybe the polyethylene oxide as well. Uh, so those are all favorable. On the unfavorable side, of course, many of them tend to be more heterogeneous and lower permeability. But then, of course, the polymer is designed to help mitigate heterogeneity, so it still makes sense. <clears throat> and you know, you need to take into account fractures. If but you know, many of the many of the carbonates I've worked on, <clears throat> they thought they were naturally fractured, and it turned out they weren't. Uh, they had history matched the water floods with uh, dual porosity models and so forth and got perfect matches. It's just a bunch of nonsense. Uh, <clears throat> the rock wasn't, except maybe really close to the well, it wasn't actually fractured. So <clears throat> I'd be very careful about that. I'm not saying none of them are, but some of them that are considered fractured aren't. Of course, even if they are, it doesn't mean you can't consider polymer flooding. Uh, and as a follow up to that, what type of alkali can be used in a carbonate reservoir with high brine hardness? Well, yeah, uh, very, the, the alkalis really can't tolerate hardness. Uh, there are some liquid alkalis now, uh, shell developed uh, MEA, uh, <clears throat> ethanolamine, it looks very interesting, and in Marmul, uh, they weren't. They didn't have to soften the water because it wasn't that hard to start with, and they also used um, scaling chemical. Uh, so, in some cases, you can get by that way. But if it's really, really hard, you're going to have to take. You're going to have to filter out the uh, calcium magnesium. That process is being done on a large scale at really low cost. I'm talking ten cents per barrel. And it's a mystery to me. I am just completely baffled. I am completely dumbfounded why there's more pushback from oil companies for doing it. They have the technology, they have the resources, they have the incentive. Uh, you can soften seawater very, very, very cheaply. Uh, I, I think there's something strange going on there, something non-technical, something political, because it just makes so much sense. And and why does it make sense to do low sal, but not uh, soften water for ASP or something like that? It doesn't make any sense. It's political. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> uh, I know we have time for maybe one last question. So uh, would you 
think uh, well completions like ICD completion would help polymer injection performance? Uh, I'm not an expert in that. I know it's been done and it's working. And so uh, it, 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 it's something that um, it's, it's an option that should be considered for that reason, because, you know, if it's if it's been observed, it might be possible. Okay, <laughs> and it has been observed, <clears throat> but you know, well completions are terribly important, and uh, that's not my expertise, but I but but it's terribly important. So again, it's a team effort. Okay, well, well, Gary, thank you for your time today and sharing your uh, all your knowledge and experience with uh, all of us, and thank you for the audience for uh, for attending and asking some questions themselves. I encourage everyone to share the uh, um, coming YouTube video of, of this um, webinar with their colleagues. So we put it on there. And of course, there's dozens of other past webinars there. And then we'll be here in a month to talk to Dr. Alberto Lopez. And so uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you.